Hi and welcome. I talk about books and I do art videos, so <laughs> if you want that kind of thing, you can subscribe. And for this video, I'm going to be talking about kind of a weird experience I had with a book recently. And I've been thinking about it for the last few days or so after I finished the book and trying to figure out what exactly it was that made me not very comfortable or, or satisfied at the end, I guess. I guess dissatisfaction. And I've kind of been figuring that it was a lot to do with that I saw the end coming. Although even beyond that, it was also something about the characters, a lack of finality. Part of it was that the book was setting up for a sequel, but there's a bit more than that. So I didn't just want to talk about this one book. I wanted to kind of make it something that would apply a little more broadly to other books. And so I thought, overall, it's really a question of expectations and what we expect from books, what books lead us to expect, a bit of the reader's contract, like I've mentioned before and have linked videos about before, which I'll do again this time. And also how sometimes there is a little bit of a fourth wall breakage between the author and the reader when we connect. And sometimes it's on purpose, and sometimes there's a little bit of a fourth wall breaking not on purpose. And so I wanted to talk about those experiences I've had with books. The two books I'm going to be talking about for examples of this are Uprooted, which if you watched my February wrap-up video, you'll know I enjoyed very much, and Stalking Jack the Ripper, which, uh, which I read, uh, in the beginning of March, right after I had finished all my February, which I read in the beginning of March, where I finished all my February books. And this is the one that prompted the discomfort and the kind of need to discuss this and make this video. So first of all, overall, I like that I I got a lot of enjoyment out of this book, and I've seen other people enjoy it, and I'm not saying that you can't enjoy it. It's got a lot of good qualities and uh, good characters, interesting takes, and a pleasant read. But there were some things that made me uncomfortable, and one of them was that I very much saw the ending coming. I'll start with the spoiler-free section, and then I'll tell you before I get spoilery. First of all, on the back, there's a little bit of a teaser to try to tell you what you're going to get out of this book. The big part says, I was the girl who loved Jack the Ripper. And thus, you know from the beginning that the Ripper is going to be one of the five or six men that are very much involved with this character. The main character only has one female friend, and she's not very much involved at all. She's she's very much a small side character meant to add a little bit to the main character and just sort of is there. She doesn't do much, which is a little... Rough. But because of the thing on the back and because of being an experienced reader, I know that this is going to be a dramatic sort of book. I am aware of it. It, the Ripper is going to turn out to be one of six or so men that the main character is fairly involved with. So the men she knows, the people we have to choose from as suspects, uh, in order of their introduction, I believe, are her uncle, who is a an ME, a medical examiner. They're not called that back then, but that's the job that he's doing. He cuts up dead people, and he's teaching her to cut up dead people and figure out what's going on with them. He has a lab and keeps specimens, that sort of thing. Which, by the way, is all quite well done. The author has clearly done her research in going back to the time period of Jack the Ripper in the late 1800s. So, A plus for historical accuracy. And, and the second one we're introduced to is Chris Thomas, and then I believe her brother, Nathaniel, and then her father, and later on a cop. So, me, immediately, I suspected the love interest, because usually that's who would hurt the most. Uh, but then I got to thinking a little bit and then reread the back and found that it said not I was in love with Jack the Ripper, but that I love Jack the Ripper. And then I was like, oh, okay, so she is opening this up to various other loving relationships. Okay. So, and I do like to try to solve cases and mysteries, which this is. I would call this a YA murder mystery suspense, probably. 
I did get creeped out by it quite a lot, so uh, she did good with that. I stopped reading it. <laughs> I was getting into a very creepy part at night and stopped reading it because I, I wanted to sleep. So, so there were a lot of aspects that I liked. Uh, another thing was it was very much written with the sort of voice that Jane Austen has, which hers were written in the early 1800s, so I suppose uh, within the same century, very similar. It has very similar speech patterns to that, both the way the characters talk to each other, which is when you've jumped into this straight from other YA fiction, it feels really weird and formal. Even between, like, family members, it feel <laughs> feels very strange when that happens, but uh, it is very much like the Jane Austen characters would talk to each other, even to their own family members, so that makes sense. And the language is very fun, and I really like the, the writing itself, the word flow, the, that kind of thing. There are a lot of lyrical parts. She handles uh, flow and syntax and rhythm quite well, but the part that I didn't like was basically the ending, so from now on there will be spoilers, and I'll put a time code on where you can skip to where I won't be discussing the spoilers. <coughs> so basically, the reason I knew how it was going to end was she did, the author did a very good job of giving us clues that weren't too obvious. She left them where they could be found, but sometimes where even the main character didn't notice them. So I really appreciate that. The clues were done really well. But the part that made the ending kind of spoiled was that as someone who's read a lot and is kind of experienced with literature and that kind of thing, I was aware of what the writer wanted to do with the story as a whole. I was aware that the writer wanted to make the ending hurt and get us in our hearts, and I knew she wanted to hurt the main character very badly with the ending, with finding out that one of the men she loved was Jack the Ripper. And so because I was aware she was planning to do that, I knew that the suspect she put forward as most likely three-quarters of the way through the book wasn't going to be it, because since the main character was suspecting him so much, she was distancing herself from him and was preparing herself to be okay with this man she loved having committed the murders, which, since this is the spoiler section, I'll tell you, is the father. It's very heavily suspected that the father is the one who has been going around murdering women, leaving little gears and things beside the bodies, taking out organs. And it's suspected that he's doing this because he's pretty much crazy because of the loss of his wife. And throughout the book, he's been shown as withdrawn, as someone who's not very much involved with his daughter or with his family at all, someone who's been very broken and distant ev ever since he lost his wife. And so... I knew that it, although the writer brought out how it would hurt the main character, the main character thinks about how it would hurt, how she doesn't want to turn her father in, how she doesn't want to know that her father's the Jack of the River, but also I knew that it wasn't going to hurt her that much because she was preparing herself and because for ever since her mother died, she's not been that close to her father. And because of various other clues and other things that I know the writer is doing, like the way she's shown the relationship with the love interest, Thomas, the way she's shown the relationship with the uncle, I know that they're out, they're not somebody who's a suspect anymore. Basically, there's a clue given by a seer sort of person, a medium who talks to the dead, who narrows down the pool to three suspects, and those suspects are the father, the brother, and the cop, who also, the cop, wouldn't upset her being a bad guy much at all. She hardly knows. And thus, obviously, although she doesn't acknowledge this, she doesn't actually pick up on her brother being a third option because of what the medium has said, but it's very obvious to me and any astute reader that the brother is a third option. It's not made very obvious, and it's not brought forward. It's done very well. I think the clue is done very well. If it was a true story, it would be really well handled. If it was a story where 
the most likely person to have done it would have done it, then it would have been a fine clue. And here we get to the breaking of the fourth wall, because I know what the author is trying to do, that she wants to hurt the character as much as possible and hurt the reader as much as possible with the final reveal, I know she's not going to make it be one of these two men who it would not hurt the character that much. In real life, <laughs> life doesn't pick out the most dramatic ending. Therefore, it would make a good mystery if the reader thought that stuff in the book would happen like real life. But because I'm aware of what the writer wants to do, I'm aware that it's not going to be like real life, it's not going to be the most likely person, it's going to be the person that will hurt the character most, and thus I knew from that moment that it was the brother. This girl has a very close relationship with her brother. The brother has been involved with the investigation from the beginning, trying to help. He's not at all been characterized as a crazy person. He's been characterized as slight, as caring too much about how he looks. He's been characterized as somebody who cares about tradition and social status and doing things the right way for their eliteness. He's but also is a very kind person who cares very much about his sister, cares about his father, cares about his uncle, cares about people in general, cares about all the little creatures, and he's just been characterized as a great guy who would have made a great, you know, side character in a, in a realistic sort of thing. And that's another area where it breaks down. The, the writer sacrificed realisticness for drama, which is not that great. So basically, the most dissatisfying thing about this book is that it makes sense at if you break the fourth wall and it's a story, but it doesn't make sense as a as something that could have really happened. And so, because I'm talking about breaking of the fourth wall in communicating with the readers and how that can change reader expectations and how that can have effect an effect on the reading experience, I wanted to bring up Uprooted, which is an example of this happening in a positive way. In my February wrap-up video, I talked about how I saw the romance coming. I saw immediately who it would be with, what sort of a romance it would be, that kind of thing. And I said that I it made me look forward to it more and feel like, oh, this is going to be good. It, whereas in this book, it made me think, oh, this is boring, I know what's going to happen, it's not going to have the proper effect on me because I know what's going to happen. Which partially is because this is a romance and this is a mystery. Of course you don't want to know <laughs> uh, what's going to happen with the mystery because that's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a mystery. But with a romance, you know, it's, it's more for the enjoyment itself rather than not knowing what's going to happen. I think part of it is, with Uprooted, the, the showing through the way things are described and such, showing how the hero, the love interest, is described and how he interacts with the character is meant to show the reader what's going to happen, meant to give them clues and get them excited about what's going to be happening, so I think it's deliberate. Whereas with this, with Stalking Jack the Ripper in a mystery, I, I don't believe she purposely let us know ahead of time that the bad guy was going to... I think she very much meant for that to be a total surprise. And so I think that's what it made what made it okay for there to be things revealed with breaking of the fourth wall in one story but not in the other. And so I kind of want to open up the discussion to you. Have you ever felt like the author was sending messages they didn't intend to send that were spoilers? Or have you ever felt that they were sending intentional signals that were fourth wall breaking, they weren't just within the story, someone in the story would see this and know this is going to happen, but someone, but a reader who is outside the story knows it's a story and knows because they're, they are aware of patterns and stories what's going to happen because of <laughs> what's been done, if any of that makes sense. I would like to know if anybody else has had experiences like that. Like... Sometimes there's foreshadowing, which is more, I feel like, some a character in the story would be able to figure out what's going to happen, whereas thematic foreshadowing and patterns like 
cyclical writing where things end up in the end the same as they were in the beginning and how a reader might expect that who is seeing something as a story but someone within the story wouldn't expect that to be their reality and I would like to talk about how that can sometimes be a good thing and that can sometimes be a bad thing so I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments so I'm going to read to you a little bit of Uprooted that took me a little bit outside the story and made me aware of what the author wanted to do between these two characters, but if I had seen it in real life, I probably wouldn't have suspected so much. I skidded three steps down onto the next landing and read headlong into the dragon. He's a person, not a dragon, by the way. I was skinny, but my father was the tallest man in the village, and I came up to his shoulder, and the dragon wasn't a big man. We nearly tumbled down the stairs together. He caught the railing with one hand, quick, and my arm with the other, and somehow managed to keep us from landing on the floor. I found myself leaning heavily on him, clutching at his coat, and staring directly into his startled face. For one moment, he was too surprised to be thinking, and he looked like an ordinary man, startled by something jumping out at him. A little bit silly, and a little bit soft, his mouth parted, and his eyes wide. Yeah, so this conversation also touches on cliches and how readers who have read a lot might be bothered by a cliche, whereas readers who are kind of new or young and haven't read something happening over and over in various different stories wouldn't be bothered because it's not old news to them, it's not expected, it's just something that's happening. And so, kind of like in Lord of the Rings, there are elves with pointy ears, and they're tall, and there's dwarves who are short and grumpy and have axes. And somebody who uh, <laughs> has read a lot of fantasy and goes and reads The Lord of the Rings might think, oh, this is so boring, I've seen all these creatures before, so on and so forth. But back when <laughs> Tolkien invented those things, it was very creative and amazing and new and different. This is a bit of a ramble because I'm not totally sure of my own thoughts, but I kind of wanted to bring up how cliches and patterns in writing and fourth wall, how cliches kind of shove us out the fourth wall and how that can be irritating to some readers but not to others and how sometimes cliches can help us, can make things kind of nice, and sometimes we like cliches, like like tropes. A lot of people like tropes such as love triangles, whereas me, I hate love triangles, but I really like some sort of cliche-ish type things that break the fourth wall, like this description of what's going on with these characters. I really like it, even though maybe it's not very realistic, or it's very clear what's what the what the writer's trying to do, but I really like it because I find it pleasant, whereas other people find love triangles very pleasant, even though others find it very tired and boring. So yeah, I'm not really providing a lot of answers <laughs> in this video so much as talking points and things to discuss. I'd love to know your feelings on cliches, tropes, and breaking the fourth wall when writing. Sometimes I feel like it can, can be a really good thing, like in a spoof, it can make things really funny or in semi-spoofs like Avatar The Last Airbender, it can help the writer to uh, take a look at their own work, to be a little bit flippant with their own work, to be a little not <laughs> so serious, and I, I like that most of the time, but other times it can be very tired and, you know, that kind of thing. So I would love to know your thoughts. And also, if any of you have read either of these books, did you see the ending of this one coming? And was that a disappointment for you, or did you like that? And what are some bits of writing that aren't necessarily cliches or tropes, but that when a writer does it, you're kind of like, oh, I know what they're doing, I feel so smart and in on the joke and that kind of thing. I'd love to know. I do like Stalking Jack the Ripper, uh, and I do recommend it if you like period stuff and you like stuff about cadavers and kind of... <laughs> and cutting them up, and if you, and if you like that sort of world, uh, she did a very, very good job with this historic history and everything. The only part that I don't really recommend is the mystery part. And that's all I have for you today. I'll see you in the next video. Bye!